Okay, it's uh, 8.31, uh, so I'm going to begin. Uh, people are still coming on, that's okay. I uh, received many, many emails, comments, questions. I, I will speak only 10, maybe 15 minutes about that because we could spend the whole class on it. But just uh, a few things I think uh, you'll find of interest. First of all, with reference uh, to what we said last class, I want to show you uh, a couple things here online. Um, hold on a second, let me pull it up here. Um, because we, right at the end, uh, we were talking about um, uh, Europe and, uh, and worms. Unfortunately, this happened. Uh, uh, dozens of uh, Jewish gravestones in the oldest uh, cemetery, in the, I think it's the oldest cemetery in Germany, um, in Worms. Uh, a woman, I'll show you what she did. Uh, here is what she did. Now this is, you're looking at on the left, that's the tombstone of Rav Mayer of uh, Rothenburg. So um, um, I don't remember offhand what day, <laughs> what his death is, but you're talking about uh, almost- 1293. Uh, Okay, so uh, um, 700 some uh, years, uh, uh, and, I, and it's, she put this paint on it. So they, so the initial news report says something about anti-Semitism, but she, she was there, they arrested her. She seems to be some crazy woman. And, uh, and on the right, that's the grave, the famous of Alexander Winthen, the um, Alexander Ben Shlomo, the man who, uh, who ransomed uh, the, uh, the bones or the body, I should say, uh, of uh, Rev. Mayor Rothenberg, and he was given the covet of uh, being buried right next to him. They don't know if they can take this off. Uh, what, what is, I mean, this is some sort of uh, paint, so uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, unfortunate, but uh, what are you going to do? Um, it, it's a great story. We don't have time uh, to talk about it now. Uh, um, I mean, this Alexander was from Frankfurt, so it's not clear why uh, uh, the Maharam was buried uh, and he was buried in Worms, uh, or at least he was living in Frankfurt, maybe he was from Worms. We don't know the details. Uh, someone even wrote an article claiming there's a, we know that there's a Jewish murderer named Alexander, and he wants to claim that uh, this is the same Alexander, uh, um, and as his tshuva, he was, um, he, want, he did this to uh, ransom uh, uh, of Mayor Rothenberg. I also mentioned uh, at the end the graves. I, I, I spoke about Eisenstadt, how it's, in, it's another incredible thing. In the middle of the city, you have this old, which was a, obviously there'd be Nazi flags flying uh, from 1938 from the Anschluss, and yet the Jewish cemetery is uh, right there. Um, two years ago, I since we can't go to Europe, I'll take you there for a minute. Uh, I go every year to um, to see the well. Let me show you to see the grave of uh, Rabbi. Uh, while we're in Eisenstadt, because Eisenstadt's such an interesting place, it's um, it's like one of the last Jewish towns. When I say Jewish towns, I think this went to the like 1920, where it had its own Jewish mayor, the Jewish section. It was completely autonomous. Uh, and you could see where the Erev was. You could see the buildings that still have the Jewish uh, symbols on it. Israel Hildesheimer opened up the first uh, uh, modern uh, like day school, uh, Yeshiva High School, I guess you can call it, with secular studies. And it also was, as we spoke last class, in the, the seven key vote. Well, the great rabbi was the, the Pandim Eros, or mayor of, Eisenstadt, mayor of Eisenstadt. And in June of 2018, the US government um, and Austria restored uh, the kever. And it's, we have something called the, the Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad. I wanna show you what it looks like, what it, if you go there, I saw it for the first time last year, but uh, this is what the kever looked like um, for all the years I went, saying here is, um, is buried uh, Mayor of based in Tequila Kadosha, Aleph Shin stands for Eisenstadt. Anytime you meet someone with the name Ash, they come from Eisenstadt, or at least uh, in the past they did. Just like Nash, Nunchen, that's the abbreviation for Nicholsburg. Uh, um, and that, that's what it looked like. And this was a place people would come. It's on the, uh, the circuit for see uh, rabbis. When I um, came uh, last time, however, lo and behold, it looks different. They redid it, and uh, now it looks like this. 
beautifully redone, and a new uh, tombstone, very nice. But what I really want to show you is on the other side, I got to go each page of this, I have to do separately. We see this. The reconstruction of the tombstone of the Pani Mira was made with the generous help of the United States Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad, June 2018, President Donald J. Trump. Uh, a couple things are of interest. Uh, we had someone on our trip from Rabbi Billet show in Long Island that he told me, and then I looked it up, Rabbi Billet was actually on, somehow he got placed on the Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad. So he obviously had something to do with this, but there's no connection per se. It's not like important people in America are descended from the Pani Meiro. This could have just as easily been done at any great rabbi's grave. I, and I don't know what the Pani Mirror has anything to do with uh, uh, America's heritage abroad uh, any more than any other uh, rabbi, uh, I guess because we're Jews and uh, we come from Europe, but still, uh, American taxpayer money, your money for those Americans went to help restore uh, this uh, tombstone. While I was there, not the, the last time, the time before, I had a very interesting experience because every time I go, we're the only people there. Lo and behold, you have the two chassidim. Uh, young, in their 20s, so with the long coats and everything, uh, and um, they, they're at the grave. And you know people go because you see the candles, they see other things. So I say, like, what, who are you? And lo and behold, these two guys are from Kiryas Yovo. We might even have people who are right here, listening right now who are with us. It wasn't a trip in 18, it was a trip in 2016. They're from Kiryas Yovo. Of course, they sound like they just came off the boat. Uh, sometimes I meet people from Kiryas Yovo, their English is perfect. Other times I meet them and it's like, uh, it's unbelievable that they're living and they're born in America. But uh, so uh, the man says, it's, it's unbelievable. He says, they're coming to the grave of um, Maram Eisenstadt. That's the mayor of Eisenstadt. So I'm talking a little bit with him. And after about a minute or two minutes of speaking, and he tells me that the guy next to him, the other guy who doesn't speak, speaks English even worse, is a direct descendant of Maram Ash, Aleph Shin. But after speaking to him for a couple of minutes, I realized that they, they are at the grave of Ma mayor of Eisenstadt, who is also called sometimes Maram Ash. But there's another uh, Mayor of there's another Mayor Ash. Oops, sorry, and um, the wrong thing. Uh, gone to. Um, there's another one, and his name is. Let me show you. Let me find it here. This one, Maram Ash. He's um 150 years later. Um, he was the Rav of Umvar. That's where Menashe Klein was. And lo and behold, these people had come all the way to Austria. They were at the, going to the grave of Maram Ash. They were at the wrong Maram Ash. This, he, this Mayor Eisenstadt, this is a different one. He's, no, he's actually known as Mayor Ash. And uh, they were all um, impressed with me after this. And uh, they started following me around, listening to what I had to say. But uh, it was incredible. They went all the way to Austria when they were supposed to should be in the Ukraine or, or someone else. Now, this... Mayor of Eisenstadt, uh, they redid his uh, Chuvot. Beautiful edition. Now, uh, this is the first volume. You see it here. And uh, so, why am I telling this to you? Because last class we spoke a little bit about uh, Kashras, we spoke about coffee. Mayor of Eisenstadt, uh, when I'm there, I speak about uh, he has a very interesting uh, approach. He has a whole Chuva there in which he says that, um, you know, what the bracha you make on tea and coffee, not shahako. He says you make a, a, a hadama. Not sure why you make hadama on uh, coffee. It's sort of like from a tree, but uh, and he explains all this and uh, he goes into great detail of that. And um, we don't, but try to think about it: why we would make uh, uh, bracha, why we wouldn't make it on um, uh, ha hadama or haets. Uh, uh, he says Ha'adama. I don't know how much he knew about coffee. He wasn't very new in the days of the Mara Majestat in the 17th uh, century. Um, Bracha Chrona, that's also a dispute. I think the standard, I don't drink coffee, like I said, I think the standard view is that you make a, uh, you don't make any Bracha after having coffee because uh, you don't uh, drink it fast enough. At least that's what the Mishnah Brewer says. And just one more thing about coffee. Um, in that, in the last, in, this is very strange. We have, we're fortunate to have listening to us right now a Dayan, Big Talmud Chacham, and I asked about this. He also finds it strange, but in Rav Mazuz's Parsha sheet for last week, 
He says you don't make a bracha on coffee. Why don't you make a bracha on coffee? He says, because people, there's no taste to black coffee unless you put sugar in it or something sweetener. Now, I don't drink it, but uh, people who drink black coffee tell me that it tastes, it has a taste. So uh, I, that, what can I tell you? That's what he says, though. You don't make a bracha. Okay, we got uh, three more minutes. Um, I don't want to spend too much time. Okay, just a couple things. Whatever I don't get to, I'll get to next class. For those who are interested, here it is, the Shari Ezra. It's a big, thick book, volume three of Rav Ezra Basri. If you, it's not an Otsur HaChachmas. I'd have to send it to you. If you look on Hoshen Mishpat, Simon Lamed Zion and Lamed Chet, that's the letter to the guy from Lakewood I mentioned, where I won't out him, because I don't know if he wants to be outed. But uh, he talks about, you know, he wants to do the right thing. He wants to pay his taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, uh, you can read, uh, this really should be translated to English, uh, really, Basri, his two letters. Uh, he says, Umash masachim alecha, that which they laugh at you, because he's trying to be honest. Al titragesh mikach. He says, don't be embarrassed by this. Don't be concerned. He said, that's the first simon in the Shulchan Aruch, where it says that people who follow Judaism, they're going to they're gonna mock them. He says, and then he says, but we know the truth. Um, that you have to be an honest and everything, etc., etc. Um, that's also service of Hashem. Uh, I we we saw already as Rabastri, we're going to see a letter from him uh, later on. For him was uh, his his son. Uh, okay, I um, I'm going to get back next week. Uh, the thing, I, the other thing I want to talk about. Someone sent me Ruvain Buhana from Paris. Sent me something very interesting about fasting, briskers and fasting. I think you'll be amazed when you hear it because it's like it's an alternative Judaism. <laughs> we're fasting. We're following what we're told by the rabbis. And then you have like an alternative Judaism. But I'll get to that next class. I also someone very. In, sent me an interesting email. I spoke about kashas and differences in Europe, and he said, but what you're speaking about is not halacha, it's policy. So I want to talk about that. And it's good to use the word policy, because a lot of people are thinking that all these disputes are politics. Now, there always politics, but I'm talking policy, and the policy is interesting in and of itself. What is policy about kashas? So I'll hold off on that for next uh, week. But I want to pick on uh, Nachum. I'm going to hold off Nachum Shemariyahu. I'll hold off on um, just, oh, actually, just quickly, Nachum Shemariyahu. Um, I'm going to apologize for not saying your last name. I know you sent it to me, but uh, um, he mentions there were some, I, I spoke about how Ashkenazim and yeshivas, Sephardic Sephardim, are not part of the curriculum. Clearly, in the last 200 years, you don't have any. But before that, you do have some. I didn't mean to say none. He points out the pre Chadash. The Shara Melech, uh, Marid al Ghazi. Marid al Ghazi is an important safer. And there's some others, uh, Maram Khabib. Um, um, if you're in Yeshiva and you're in Masach Sukkah, it's very important. I'll just add one more point. I mean, the couple's tomorrow, I'm talking about. That's his book. But um, where Shemaria, Nachman Shemaria mentions the safe, the, if you learn Mishnah Bur, you often see a safer called Maimar Mordechai, which if in Hebrew it's written that the author is uh, Mordechai Karmi. In uh, French, it's Cremieux. Uh, you can check this, uh, Nachman, but I'm certain he is not a Sephardi. He was, he's from uh, Provence, and Jews were never expelled from Provence. Well, they were expelled just briefly, but when you speak of the great expulsion from France, they went to Provence. He is a Provence, this is a Provencal family that goes all the way back. Uh, Adolf Cremieux, the, the, the statesman, is, is from this family, but this is not Sephardi. This is Provencal. Um, Okay, let us pick up where we are. Where are we? We are in, um, we're continuing in uh, Yoridea. Those who have the book, those who don't have it, you can uh, order it if you wish. We're continuing Simon Mem, number uh, 40. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to talk again about um, the Mate Levi, Mordechai Horovitz. I think we said, maybe, I think someone said last class, and I mistakenly agreed that Ravitzak Uno, who we mentioned last week, was the son of the Mate Levi. It's not true. He was a student. The question is Is there a prohibition of Chukos imitating the non Jews by wearing, remember those old gowns that the Chazanim uh, used to wear? They, they still do wear it, but the rabbis used to wear gowns as well. 
it was called in German, the Taller. Um, the, it's written to a Rabbi Menachem Giat. I, I don't know him. I just wrote to him because he made a mistake, as we'll see in a book. He published a very long book called the Chukos Olam, which is about the, the issue of um, imitating non-Jews practice, non-Jews practice. Before we get to that, I want to show you a picture. Uh, let's see here. This is a picture. Who do you think this is? You think this is an Anglican minister here? Looks like one, but this is anyone who has their Sansino books of the Bible, Reverend Abraham Cohen. He did a number of the books. He edited the whole Sansino books of the Bible. He himself did the Frum version of the Torah. You all know the Hertzchamish. Well, the Sansino put out another one, which only quotes Mefarshi, Rashi, Ramban, Ibn Ezra, Sforno, and that's edited by Reverend Cohen. He wasn't a rabbi. They, he was, they didn't give smicha in those days in England. Uh, he came out of Jews College a Reverend, but he was quite learned. He translated one of the volumes of the Sansino Talmud into, um, uh, into English. And look at him. He looks like uh, an Anglican minister, even a Catholic, not so much a Catholic priest, because I don't have that big one, but he'll say an Anglican minister. Or how about um, here, Rabbi Herman Adler, chief rabbi of uh, England uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Look in that uh, outfit. He looks also just like he's some Anglican minister. And these outfits were worn all the way up um, into the late 70s, you can still have, uh, we have some people from England making it remember even later, but, uh, and this was a standard sort of dress. So what's going, and also in Germany. So what's going on here? Is this permissible or not? And why would anyone want to wear this? But oops, what is this permissible? Um, well, why should it be impermissible? Well, because uh, it's taken from the non-Jews. This isn't a Jewish garment, uh, it's a non-Jewish garment. On the other hand, uh, is everything from the non-Jews impermissible? The standard, there's a famous Vilna Gaon who says that anything we wouldn't do on our own, which we take from the non-Jews, is forbidden. However, that's not the halacha. The halacha of the Shulchan Aruch, which is, goes back to the Marik, Rav Yosef Kolon, and the Rivash, and is the standard halacha. The Vilna Gaon is like an outlying view, which is not accepted, is that anything from non-Jews that we take from non-Jews is permissible unless it has a connection to Avodah Zara, their religion, or sexual immorality. But if non-Jews are wearing a certain clothes and we decide, oh, it's nice clothes, that's okay. If non-Jews decide to uh, do a certain practice uh, because it, uh, you know, they want to put a clock on their church and we say, well, let's put a clock on the shul. This is, uh, you have a truth actually about this in the, uh, the the safer Krach Shul Romi of Yisrael of the Rav of Rome. Uh, we're not putting the clock in our soul to imitate them. We're doing it because it's a good idea. Uh, when our kids graduate, they wore the graduation gowns. Uh, it's not uh, we're you know we're doing if it has a good reason a tom a good tom, then it's permissible. So what's going on here with the the garb? Well, let me tell you why I wrote to this rabbi. Yeah. Uh, and, and incidentally, that's the reason why it would be regarded as permissible and why they uh, said it is, because uh, it wasn't thought to be a Christian. It's not a, there's no crucifix or anything. It's, it's just considered a dignified garb. Now, how a collar, <laughs> when you look like a priest, looks to, is dignified uh, and isn't, but because remember, it wasn't just the Catholics, it was the Protestants. It was regarded as a garb for uh, religious functionaries without having any connection whatsoever to uh, the, the religion itself. At least that's how they understood it. And uh, with the gown, it's the same uh, sort of thing. Uh, it wasn't connected per se with uh, Christianity. Now in the Sefer though, of course, he writes that this is absolutely forbidden. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, wear this at all. Um, and then he quotes the Mate Levi. The Matei Levi is um, Mordechai Harvitz. I want to read you what he says. And um, well, I want to read you what the Matei Levi says and how he misunderstood it. Um, and why he was, uh, I, I, it's hard for me to even think he actually looked inside because he quotes Rav Chaim Ozer Brzezinski. Rav Chaim Ozer actually, uh, he cites the Matei Levi. And uh, I'm thinking maybe he uh, took it from him. Uh, just want to... Um, if everyone is not muted, I'm hearing a background noise. So uh, if you're not muted, please uh, mute yourself or Rabbi Kelman and see if everyone is muted. Okay, the Mate Levi, if you look in his chuvas, um, 
Mate Levi, Chelak Beis, Simon um, Vav. He's writing to Rav Davi C. Hoffman, the great Rav Davi C. Hoffman in Germany. They had this problem with organs. That uh, the reform started it, that it, was, it wasn't just the reform, it was people, quasi reformers. And you, the, the real problem was that you had many rabbis who were hired in communities where they had an organ, and for Parnassa, they felt they had to do it. Uh, so the rabbinical seminary of Berlin put the, in, in everyone's smicha that if you um, accept a position of a shul with an organ, your smicha is revoked. Today they talk about revoking smichas. The, the first example I know of really of revoking smichas on any large scale is, um, is in, Ber in Germany where they said, they didn't actually do it, but they said we would revoke the smicha. When you're hired by these shuls that have an organ, if your smicha is revoked, they don't care because <laughs> you already had smicha. There was a case uh, earlier on in Italy where they wanted to remove someone's smicha. Um, in general, we don't do that. We've had all sorts of people who smicha should be revoked, involved in all sorts of problems. But once you start going down that road, uh, then all of a sudden everyone's going to say, well, you should uh, revoke this person's smicha and that person. So it's better to keep away from it, uh, I think. But uh, Rav David C. Hoffman had claimed that, or had said that um, it's chukos agayim to have an organ in the shul. And therefore, you couldn't have the organ, even on uh, during the week, you couldn't use the organ. And uh, Ramor Haharovitz, he doesn't like that. He says, uh, what's the chukos agayim? Uh, he says, it's not chukos agayim. It's not the, we know that there was an organ in the Altnoy Shul in Prague. Um, he says, why do we have to tell people it's Lucas of Allian? And when it's not, just tell them the truth, that it's a rabbinic prohibition if you uh, use it on Shabbos, because in those days, it wasn't like the earlier reformers were a non-Jew did it. Jews played the organ. And also, it's a minagafi of a parsim. It's a practice of the heretics. And we don't want to be like the heretics. He says, but we don't need to make up, like, say something's Torah prohibition when it's really not. There's a, in my book, the last book, well, not this one, the change in the immutable. In the last chapter, I discuss, are you allowed to uh, raise the prohibition? Can you tell some people that something's a Torah prohibition, even if it's only rabbinic? Believe it or not, there are Gadolin who say you can. Um, and maybe that's what Jordan Sehapin was doing. I think Soloveitchik might have even done this. If you look in uh, the Litvin book about the, sanct the sanctity of the synagogue, he's, he says that the show without a machitza, it's a doraisa. It's forbidden in a Torah, from the Torah, not to have machitza. And then he cites a verse from, I think it's Zechariah. So how could, if it's from the Torah, how could you cite it from Zechariah? So I don't know if there's a little bit of rhetoric going on there. But don't see how So the Mordechai Matthew Levi says, no, it's not a Torah prohibition. And then he says, and if you're going to say that it's a problem, that it's a Torah prohibition, anything the non-Jews do, he says, what do we do about the taller, the... Uh, the, the gowns. He says, who got fame or a gown? He says, this is even worse than an organ because the organ, they also use it at concert halls. But the only place they use this uh, gown is in a, um, is in a church. And he says, and, and it had, if the non-Jews wouldn't be wearing this, we definitely wouldn't be wearing it. If the Christian preachers weren't wearing it, we wouldn't be wearing it. But his point is that not everything that the, the non-Jews do is prohibited. And if you're going to say an organ's prohibited, because they also use in the church, it's prohibited from chukas agayim, then you have to say that the, these gowns that we wear are prohibited. Um, now, the Mate Levi wore a gown. All the rabbis in Germany wore a gown. Even the Würzburger Rav wore a gown, and he was the big opponent to Hirsch. And he, on the right, the Hirsch wore a gown. But uh, um, the, this author, Rabbi Giat, he didn't get this. He thought that the Mate Levi was saying that it's forbidden when that's the exact opposite of what he's saying. So I wrote to him and I explained this to him and uh, I said that Mate Levi himself wore the gown as did all the rabbis in Germany. Uh, and then he says, well, you know, the Rechai Moser says the same thing and he leaves it as a question. He says, uh, this, shouldn't this be a problem? Ain't no move on. Uh, you know, why is this uh, permissible? Um, if he looks a little harder, this the author of this safer, he'll learn why it's permissible. That that's uh, I hate to say it, the rabbis in every one of our shuls are wearing non-Jewish clothing. They wear these well, not if you go to a Hasidic shul, maybe or actually that too. Going back a couple hundred years, that's what the goyim wore. Anyone wearing a regular suit, you think the Jews made this up? We learned it from the non-Jews. But of course, not everything we get from the non-Jews is prohibited, uh, and uh, so it's not a question. It's, uh, it's strange, 
why they felt they had to uh, look like this, but it's no stranger than the choirs. It's no stranger than the sermon. Where did the sermon come from? The sermon in Germany also came from the non-Jews. Traditional shuls never had sermons. As I've said many times before, the sermon is a takeoff of the Protestant and Catholic homilies that are supposed to edify. Uh, real shuls don't have sermons, I should say, didn't have sermons. Today they do, they didn't. Uh, if you come with us to Budapest, there's no sermon there. It's, it's, it's against the, uh, the decree in Hungary. You can't have uh, these sermons uh, in the vernacular. So what happens is after Davni, you go to a side room, you sit down for Kiddush and then the Rav, We'll speak Torah, speak a little Torah, but that's not a sermon. We all know the difference between a sermon and a um, and uh, traditional learning. Uh, we call it a drusha today, but uh, this is uh, this is taken from the Christians as well, and the choir is taken from what was done in the churches, and they thought it's dignified to uh, look a certain way, um, and that's that's why it was uh, permissible when it became. Um, I guess when uh, the Orthodox community um, changed in the 20th century, it became very strange to see um, people in these gowns. And um, to see, in any event, uh, even without that, uh, it, it's still very strange to look at these reverends and uh, people, even rabbis, like Chief Rabbi Adler, dressed this way and with the clerical collar. I have a picture of one of those Dionium from the London Basin in the 1940s with the clerical collar. And he's a Dayan on the Basin. Well, he's not wearing a yarmulke either because even the Dayanim of the London Basin didn't always wear yarmulkes. Uh, I have a picture of him. I have a picture of Chief Rabbi Hertz without a yarmulke. That's also like the German uh, thing, but um, that's what it was. We can't, uh, and uh, we have to be very thankful to um, Reverend Cohen because uh, he did a very good job on, um, he also edited a volume on the Rambam. Uh, um, okay. that's. Simon Mem. Now we're off to Simon Mem Aleph. Simon Mem Aleph. We're going to hear a um, an answer. Hold on a second. No, it's not from this rabbi. His name is Rabbi Chaim Rappaport. There's a number of lengthy letters in the book from Rabbi Chaim Rappaport. I uh, I thank um, him because he um, he spent so much time in lengthy letters. Um, I don't. Hold on a second here. Um, I wanted to show you this. Um, he's well known for um, this. Well, he's not so well known for, uh, hold on. Um, pull it up here, here. He's well known for this book, Judaism, Homosexuality, and Authentic Orthodox View. And when it came out, he was very popular, um, speaking at various, for various groups. It's the most liberal approach to homosexuality. Uh, at the time he was, um, he's a Chabad rabbi, but much broader, studied in Litvish and yeshivas, a huge Talmud Chacham, who's Rosh Kowal, I think both in Australia and in Leeds. And he was the chief rabbi Sachs's advisor on medical ethics. So he presents a very liberal view that uh, against the, we're against the action, but not the individual. He doesn't even have a problem if homosexuals want to be members of uh, couples, members of the shul, of, of the shul together. Basically, he's not looking at people's bedrooms and uh, trying to come up with uh, a, a more, as liberal as you can get. Uh, today, he's regarded as one of the enemies because uh, he doesn't acknowledge the complete legitimacy of homosexuality in all of its forms. So it, it's pretty amazing how in 15 years, uh, the whole world changed, but uh, he was regarded as a big ally uh, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and I encourage everyone to examine the book. He also, <laughs> since I pulled it up, I'll show you. He also wrote uh, this book, which uh, the afterlife, well, the after, he wrote the afterlife of Scholarship, Critical View of the Rebbe by Samuel Hyman and Nachum Friedman showing certain errors in that book, but he wrote another book against David Berger and um, David Berger's attack on uh, Chabad. Um, he, uh, the question I asked him was as follows. Um, he's, you can hear some of his classes on uh, Torah in motion, uh, quite a fascinating individual uh, and has a great Hebrew uh, style. I, I was learning a sugya and I wrote to him uh, with the following question. I know him for many years. Uh, much money do you have to spend to save someone else, save someone's life? We always get these appeals and they're constantly sent to us that so-and-so needs a kidney. How much money are you gonna have to spend? 
because on the face of it, there is the halacha that um, there's a limit. To, there's a limit to what you have to spend, let's say, to buy a lulav. You don't have to bankrupt yourself uh, to buy a lulav. However, to avoid a negative commandment, the sources say that you have to uh, spend everything. Um, so what would that mean? We have a negative commandment. Don't stand idly by the blood of your brother. So if, if you can sell your house and uh, so your whole pension, sell everything so you have no money, but you'd save your neighbor's life, and without it, he's going to die, are you obligated to? As the Shemas would say, Pashtas, it would seem, if you just look on the surface level, uh, you should. On the other hand, this has never happened before in history, but maybe it hasn't happened because we haven't been doing uh, the right thing. So this is, I'm not asking him, I really, I'm asking for alumnus to understand sudyas. And that's what he provides me. It's a fairly long uh, tshuva of about 10 pages. And uh, he begins by saying that uh, this would appear, I mean, the, the Ramah says, uh, you have to uh, give up all your money so as not to violate a negative commandment. Um, so apparently you'd have to. And he continues, he goes through the halacha, you can't stand idly by the, the blood of your father, your, your brother, et cetera, et cetera. However, then he gets into a, a discussion because there's actually a debate among this, among the, the post-Shulchanarach authorities, what type of negative commandment? Because you can have two types of negative commandments. Um, you can have a negative commandment that, um, um, which is a um, sheval tase, where you don't do you don't do anything. You just sit there, but you don't actually violate. And then you could have a negative commandment, which you're actually violating. So what, what would be the the difference? Well, losam al dam If I sit and do nothing, I haven't violated a negative commandment. So there are some authorities who hold that in a case like that, I wouldn't have to give up all my money. However, I couldn't actually, let's say, eat tarfus. So for instance, let's say I, I only have $1,000 to my name, $10,000, and I'm starving, and I have two pieces of food, and one is kosher, but it's going to cost me $10,000, or one is treith, and the guy's going to give it to me for free. According to these figures, according to the understanding of the Ramah, according to these Ahroni, would be only in this case. You would have to pay everything so that you would not eat uh, the tray food. Um, and, or you could, I, I thought of another example uh, today. Let's say someone says uh, you have a million dollars and he says he gives you an option. You can bow to this idol or I will kill you. Of course, normally you have to be killed or you can pay a million dollars and you can live. But, so you wouldn't have to bow to the idol. You pay a million dollars. Uh, um, in that case as well, you'd have to pay the money. So Rabbi uh, Rappaport goes through the different uh, uh, svaras back and forth. He doesn't, at the end actually, um, and he quotes the Chassam Sofer. The Chassam Sofer says that if it's not a kumbase, if it's just you can shave out the house and not do anything, like someone's dying there, but I'm not actually violating anything per se in an active way, I don't have to give all my money. Nevertheless, he cites numerous sources that, and this seems to be the standard view, including the Sri Deesh, that uh, this is a Sri Deesh. You have to spend all your money to save someone. You can imagine a case in World War II, let's say, where uh, Rabbi Weissmandel said, I, we can save this person, but it's going to be $100,000. And you go around, you ask, and no one's going to give it to you, but you have $100,000. According to this, you'd be obligated to spend $100,000. So it seems from all these sources, and that seems to be the standard view. At the end, he quotes the Tzitz Eliezer. The Tzitz Eliezer has a, a different perspective, but he, re, he agrees with the Chazan Sofer. He rejects the Tzitz Eliezer. Tzitz Eliezer quotes, this is on volume um, nine, uh, Simon Mem, hey, he quotes an amazing Chiddush of Rav Shomu Kuger. The Gemara says, says um, you, with all your soul, soul and all your might, you love God. Why do you have both? The Gemara says, some people prefer money over their life. Uh, so Rav Shomo Kluger derives from this that if someone, uh, <laughs> incredible, if, if someone, there's money is more important to them than their life, 
then such a person is not obligated to spend all his money to avoid a, a, a negative commandment. Only the three big ones. Uh, it's Rashomo Kluger, he comes up with some really unusual ideas. These geniuses, sometimes they come up with things, the minchas like that, they just, the rugged shover, it just makes no sense when you look at it from the outside, but on the inside it does. But this, hey, that, and, and Rabbi Rappaport concludes that according to the mainstream view, you would be. If you could save someone's life, and we speak about how every life is uh, is precious, Endless, it's not it's obviously worth more than money. He says, you would have to spend all your money. And at the end, I have a note there and says, nevertheless, in all generations, no one ever followed this. There were always sick people who, uh, you know, needed lots of uh, money. And we never heard, I say, not among the rabbis, not among the masses, that someone is supposed to sell their entire property and just be left homeless even uh, to save someone else's life. And uh, I ask, uh, how, do these, um, um, how does this practice that we've all done make sense with all the sources we've seen? I, I think people reading it will get a sense of what I'm saying. It doesn't. At the end of the day, uh, we, we, we are going, I should have added that uh, it's clear that we're going like the Hassan Sofer. When I say we're going like the Hassan Sofer, who doesn't require this, it doesn't mean anyone ever thought of it and said, well, this is the Hassan Sofer position, we don't have to. It was just obvious though, that people are not gonna give up all their money. Uh, um, maybe you can make a claim, case even that if no one else is willing to give, why should I give everything up? Um, you know, you go to 10 people and each one of them says, I'm not gonna pay a penny. So now it comes to us ten thousand dollars. If everyone gave ten thousand, and now it's cost hundred thousand. If everyone gave ten thousand, then we'd be okay. Why should I have to pay a hundred thousand? Because everyone else said no. Uh, if and someone's going to die, uh, you know, maybe it's not our issue. It's um, that's what the Chassam Sofer uh, holds. Um, he, the Chassam Sofer deals with the fact. And what about the, for the people who oppose the Chassam Sofer? What about the fact that we know that the community is not obligated to pay more than someone's worth? If they, um, if they kidnap someone, and kidnapping used to be a big thing, and uh, they say, uh, you know, give us a billion dollars to return them or we're going to kill them. The, we're already told by Chazal that you don't have to pay someone more of their worth. Why not? If you're telling me that an individual has to, so the Chassam Sofer says even those people would assume that the community uh, doesn't have to do that. Uh, um, if these are things to think about, or on this, I don't want to spend any more time on this, but it's an example, it's a good example of how um, just knowing the reality, it never could happen. You're never going to have people sell every penny they have to save a life. Maybe they'll do it for their children, but uh, to sell every penny, to get rid of every penny they have, to sell a stranger, even though we're told that uh, you have to do something like that according to many sources. So it's, um, it, it's something to think about Let the rabbis uh, write some good Torah on it. I think halacha ma'isa, we, this isn't like one of those cases where you could say it seems to go against the halacha, but what are you gonna do? Because after, after all, the Chassam Sofer holds that you wouldn't need to because it's not a kumase. You, you're actually shev al You're not doing an action um, per se. Um, but that's uh, that's uh, Akan Simon uh, Mem Aleph. Now, um, we've got about 20 more minutes. I'm going to skip Mem Bays through uh, Mem um, Vov, uh, actually through Mem Zion. Uh, they deal with uh, Nida issue. I don't, don't need to do it, get into this in a public forum. Uh, um, Deals with Rabbi, those who are interested, a, a big, unusual, and unconventional view of Rabbi Abadi. So it's interesting, but we can skip right to Memchet, which is, um, I think you'll find interesting. Uh, questions here are sent to uh, these two individuals. Pictures here. Well, first one, this, you should all recognize him. This is Rabbi Yitzhak Yosef, the son of Rabbi Madi Yosef, the Rishon Lutzion, uh, chief rabbi. And the other is to this individual, his brother, Rav Avram Yosef, who was the uh, Rav of um, Cholon. Things didn't work out uh, so well for Rav Avram Yosef uh, because um, he was uh, kicked out of his, he was, his father wanted him to be the chief rabbi of Israel because he's a community rabbi, unlike his brother. Uh, the thing is, though, while this was getting going about the chief rabbinate, 
he was brought up on charges and um, he uh, had to leave his rabbinate in Cholon later and the rabbinate Rabbanut HaRashit. I, I, I really, I don't live in Israel, so I can't say I understand the case. Uh, he, um, he said that there are only three hashkachas. If you want to be called Mahadrin in Cholon, there's only three hashkachas I'll, I'll accept. One was Rabbi Landau, one was um, the Badatz Eid Haredit, and the other was uh, Beit Yosef. Now, Beit Yosef is hashkacha from his father. And uh, Ravad Yosef started hashkacha to be makpid on Sephardic kashras. He even was sentenced instantly to five months in prison, but I think it was suspended. Um, so there's only there's two Ashkenazic Hachshayrim Badats, uh, Mahadrin, and one Sephardic established by his father. And he was brought up on charges because he said that this is like a nepotism, that he's sending business to his family. That is, his, uh, his brother was head of uh, the Hashkacha. But he said that, uh, first of all, none of this was secret. It's not like uh, any private thing where he said, you know, uh, give me some money. This was a public thing that these are the only three Hashkachas that I will um, uh, accept. So you could say, so they said, well, there are other Mahadran Hashkachas. I don't know what to tell you. He, he said that among the Sephardic Hashkachas, the only one he would accept was uh, his, his family's Hashkachas. So they said that that's using your position to funnel money because they couldn't get a Mahadran, which means like a super Hashkacha, unless they, if they want, but they, even though they could have gone to the Ashkenazic ones, if they wanted a Sephardic Hashkacha, that was the only one. And he said, that's the only one I accept. Uh, so, but they said that that's criminal. I, I don't, I, I see there's a conflict of interest here, but that's, I, 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 he, I don't think he was doing it for the money. He didn't trust the other hashkachas. He says, if you want to have Mahadran, Ravad Yosef is giving them Mahadran hashkacha. The fact that it's his father, okay, so it's his father. I, I, a lot of people think this was a big scandal and this was um, completely inappropriate, but that's uh, that's what brought him down. I, I, I look, I know that what they say about Caesar's wife, uh, even beyond the hint of impropriety. Uh, I guess in retrospect, he should have also added another Sephardic, uh, but he had been doing that for years, and for, and and for years there only was one, and now there's Rav Mahmoud and others. But uh, uh, Rav Vadia created this Hashkacha precisely because he didn't think that the Ashkenazic Hashkachas took Sephardic considerations. For instance, the Badatz the Eid Haredit would have um, grape juice, which was water had all this water in it, which according to the Sephardim, according to Shacharach, it doesn't count. You can't make a guffin on it. And uh, other practices, Rav Yosef is very mockpit on glot kosher. He's very mockpit that on uh, Bishalakum for that the, the Jew has to do all the cooking. So he, he created his own Hashkacha and it's a wide Hashkacha now. But I, uh, I, I, uh, I know he's a big Talmud Chacham, Rav Avram Yosef, and uh, as I said, none of this was secret or anything. Usually when you're trying to, uh, you know, do something criminal, you, you make it secret. And But this was well known, and this was when, even when he was before, when he was the rabbi, I think it's in the city, or Yehuda. So I, I don't consider this a case, unless I get other information. I, it seems to me that this maybe is, uh, is the judicial system uh, run amok. His ashkafas were also pretty good if you're a religious Zionist. Um, oh, so Michael, so why did I read them? If you study the works of Chacham Avad Yosef, which I've been studying his works um, since I was probably 18, 19 years old. Um, um, I even wrote a long article about him. Um, um, you can find it online and many other times I've dealt with him. You often get the sense that Rav Avad Yosef feels that everyone in Eretz Israel doesn't matter Ashkenazi or not, Sephardi, you all should follow the Shulchan Aruch, Rav Yosef Karo. Rav Yosef Karo is what he calls Mara Atra, the, the Rav of the land of Israel. He explains that anyone who moves to Eretz Yisrael, since the, the, the rulings of the, of the Shulchan Aruch were accepted in the land of Israel, everyone who moves there has to follow the rulings of the Shulchan Aruch, leave behind the Ramos Israelis in the diaspora. And Chacham Avad Yosef is explicit about this. If you come as an individual, you would have to do that years ago. But he seems to be implying at some places that even if you come as a community in the land of Israel, you have to follow the Shulchan Aruch. And many people have written on Avad Yosef. That's their conclusion, that he holds that you have to, everyone really should follow the Shulchan Aruch. But I never bought this. Because throughout his writings, he also speaks about like how Ashkenazim have to observe kidney out and other things. So I never thought, 
I thought I always thought everyone was wrong in assuming that you had to be a Sephardi in Eretz Yisrael, and the only reason he didn't speak publicly about it was not to create waves, because as I said, he has an explicit responsa, responsa about kitneos, and he doesn't say that Ashkenazim don't have to keep kitneos. I assumed that how to understand all these apparent contradictions is that Rabbi Vadya felt that anyone, if they wanted to, could become a Sephardi in Israel. You didn't have to as an Ashkenazi. You, you, know, you come to Israel now as an Ashkenazi, there are already communities there, you can remain part of the community. But if you want to become a Sephardi, because we know that according to Rabbi Vadya, really being a Sephardi is better than being an Ashkenazi for all sorts of reasons, you could. But I didn't know that this, if this was the case. So I wrote to both of them, Rav Yitzhak Yosef, and um, Rav Avram Yosef, what the halacha is, what the, you know, getting the opinion of their father, which they're going to give. We're going to see they disagree. It's not the, it's not the only time that children of Rav have disagreed. The big dispute was about Bamba. What bracha you make on Bamba? You have two brothers quoting their father as saying different things. But Rav Yitzhak Yosef is very clear, and he's the chief rabbi now. He says that if you're an Ashkenazi and your parents are religious, uh, you follow Ramosha Israelis, you can't change because of alti tosh torati mecha. But if you uh, are a Baal Tshuva, like let's say um, you are in Israel and you become a Baal Tshuva, um, as soon as you have no Masorah, you can't say, well, my parents, we're, we're from Germany or something, because if your parents are not religious, the assumption is that you don't have a tradition. It's been broken. So if you become religious in Israel, then he says, you can begin to follow the Shulchan Aruch. He says, for good and for bad. That means, I guess, uh, waking up early soon in Elul to do those slichos and glot kosher, because uh, super glot, uh, chalak, they call it, uh, because Chachamavad Yosef holds that all Sephardim must only eat glot kosher. And you're saying, what's the big deal? In America, we love glot kosher. It's not true. The only place in America you can get glot kosher is in Deal and in Brooklyn, maybe in Chicago and Los Angeles, I guess, I guess there. You can't get Chicago got kosher anywhere else as far as I know in America. Yeah, it says glot, but it's not real glot. It just means that uh, it's of a higher level. They, they, but it's not, it's not Beit Yosef. It's not what we call uh, uh, chalak, the old real glot, where there's no uh, adhesions. Uh, um, despite what Ravadya said, Sephardim around the world never did this. Um, it was considered a very pious thing. But the Shulchan Aruch says you have to, even in Spain they didn't keep uh, glot. Um, but Ravadya says now that we're coming back to the land of Israel, you have to. So that's, that's tough. Because in Israel, the regular restaurants, you go to the regular restaurant down the street and it's not glot kosher. All you people who say, well, I eat glot kosher, you think you eat it when you go to Israel, unless you're going to a Mahadran place. And I don't even know if it's Mahadran. It might only be certain Mahadrans. And uh, I can tell you that the hotels do not have glut, even when they say Mahadran. I was at the uh, the Inbo, and uh, the the um, the Inbo hotel told me uh, I spoke that even that though it says Mahadran, it doesn't mean uh, glut chalak beis yosef. Um, it just means it's a higher level of shkacha. So a lot of Ashkenazim don't realize this. So, uh, but Rav Yitzhak Yosef says you can become Sfardi, but only if you're about Tshuva and you become complete Sfardi and you get certain advantages, obviously. You can eat kidney os and uh, other things as well. So the answer, uh, my question is answered, which I, my assumption was that anyone could become Sfardi. He says no. But then I get the letter and we're going to, this issue we'll come back to later because he returns to it in a later Tshuva, Rav Yitzhak. But because I asked a question on this. So then we get the letter from Rav Avram Yosef. And both of them are telling me what the father holds. All of this. Rav Avram Yosef says something different. He says, first of all, it's permissible, you know, we hold, it's permissible for an Ashkenazi to be an Ashkenazi in Eretz Yisrael, which is what I always thought was the case, even though many think really Rav Avram doesn't hold that. Why? And he explains, because when they came here, they established their own Bate Din. They came as communities. The, the Prushim came, the Hasidim came, they didn't come. If they came as individuals, then they'd have to be absorbed into the larger community. That's the halacha. But if you come as a community, as they did, then they open up their own show and their own, uh, their own base too. And that's not a problem. And therefore, he says, today, Ashkenazi Shalom is Israel, uh, an Ashkenazi comes to Israel, no problem, he can observe uh, as an Ashkenazi. But then, so here's my question. An Ashkenazi who comes to Israel and wants to be a Sephardi in every matter. 
he is permitted to daven and to follow halacha like marana shulchan aruch bein lahakel bein lahachmir. You can become a svardi again, the good and the bad. They're using those good and bad in quotes. Uh, uh, like I said, the people and, and, and I'm joking when I say about getting up for seichas. So that's not really a halacha, but of course, if you want to be a real svardi, you have to get up for uh, for that. He says when he's in chutz laaretz, he can't change his practices. Today, living in America, I cannot decide I'm going to be a svardi. As it says, Alti Tosh Tarasi Mecha. However, uh, and, and therefore, Sardi cannot feed me kidneyos. I have to respect my Mahagi, but when I go to Israel, he says again, Rashai, he palev, so kadat, maran, shokhanach, ben lahak, ben lahmir. So here, Avavim Yosef says direct opposite of his brother and says that uh, the Halacha, and he's reflecting what he believes his father holds, is that an Ashkenazi can become a Sephardi in the land of Israel, because, as we know, the land of Israel is Atarei de Maran, is the land of the Shulchan Aruch. So who is right in this dispute? Unfortunately, we can't ask the Chacham Avadia, and it could be the Chacham Avadia gave different answers at different times, although Rav Avram Yosef's understanding is exactly what I assumed it was. But let me show you something else, which... Uh, we bring the Kasuf Hashlishi, the third verse. When you have a dispute between two, two opinions, you bring the third one. I found something uh, of interest which uh, supports um, what uh, Rav Avraham Yosef says. Um, I'll show you where it comes from here. There's a book that came out. Um, it's, I think, 14 volumes. It's called Mayan Omer. It's the, the Ravad Yosef has a number of students, and people used to come to him uh, one day a week for uh, maybe gave him two hours, and they'd come and they'd stand online and they ask questions. And when the people were not, um, I guess, learned enough to formulate the question, they would ask the Yehuda Naki, who was a Talmud of Ravad and he would ask the question. And he recorded all these questions and all these answers. Uh, and they published like 14 volumes. So what is the status of a book like this? Because it's not like Rav Avad Yosef himself wrote it out. These are oral answers. And then in the notes, he explains the basis for this. He cites the other writings. So normally, if Chacham Avad, you write something and then you have an oral, you could say, well, maybe it's uh, specific circumstances or something like that. But in this case, it actually supports Rav Avraham Yosef. Just a bit of uh, technical things here. Uh, the, the name of the book, it's, uh, how do you say this name? Could be that there are people listening here who have uh, granddaughters with this name. And uh, uh, if you ask, you go to Israel today, you meet a lot of people, Ma'ayan. That's their name, Ma'ayan. So this would be Ma'ayan Omer. And yet, what can I say? If you look in Tanakh, the word appears a few times. It also appears in the Torah in uh, Vayikra. Um, the Mem, of course, uh, has a patach under it. Uh, um, the Yud has a kamatz, but what's under the ayin? It's not a patach. It's not ma'ayan. There's a shva under the ayin. The word is pronounced ma'ayan. Um, it's, this is a, uh, it, it's become ma'ayan. Joshua, Yoshua Blau, he's 101 years old, a great, great scholar of Hebrew language and Arabic, the publisher of the Chuvas Ramam. He has a whole article in which he deals with how certain words changed their form in, uh, in Israel um, and became things that they're really not grammatically. So the word is uh, in biblical Hebrew. It's not like in modern Hebrew changed it actively. It became, as people were speaking, Instead of saying mayan, they, they, they turned it into ma'ayan, like languages uh, developed. So it is a mistake, but sometimes mistakes become uh, accepted. But if someone in Torah reading reads it ma'ayan, he has to um, uh, be corrected, I would think, or he should be corrected. I don't know if he has to be, because it doesn't change the meaning. Uh, interestingly, uh, I will uh, show you, there is a, uh, <laughs> the Hebrew journal, it's a famous uh, Torah journal. It's been around for 50 years. They get it right. You see, it's Hamayan, not Hamayan. 
I know there are people here from Bergen County. You might be upset what I'm going to tell you now, and uh, you don't have to make any trouble, believe me. But um, there's a school there. And um, where is it? Uh, here. I have all my stuff here. I prepare today. Ah, here it is. What can I say? Uh, the word in Hebrew is not ma'ayanot. It's, it appears a number of times in Tanakh. The word is mayanot. Mem, ayan, there's a shva under the ayan. There's no patach under it. So what can I say? Uh, um, and they're not doing it for any modern Hebrew. They just got it wrong. Uh, they're not the only ones to get it wrong. I showed you this uh, picture here before. Oops. Believe it or not, uh, Lakewood, Lakewood now has a website. There's nothing on the website just to donate. They don't have Shirim or anything. But Lakewood has a website. I never thought I'd see the day. I, I, I confess, when I see a picture like this, on the one hand, I'm very impressed with all the people there. It's, it's really unbelievable. On the other hand, I look at it, uh, it's not Shabbos, white and black. Uh, I don't know, I can't wrap my head around that. Uh, everyone in white, uh, I, I, I don't see. I, uh, um, here's a, um, I found a picture before, where is it? Um, Oops. Here, there's Rav Lichtenstein. Look at the color. There's, I don't think there's anything wrong with having color. Um, I'll show you um, some other pictures here of other great yeshivas. I can, let's see. Uh, no, I have to pull it up. Uh, Shivas Haramor, you have color. Merkaz, color, so whatever. That's just my, my, my little uh, shtick that uh, I don't see why everyone, because in, in Lithuania, the idea of everyone would, this is like a Hasidic thing, that everyone would have to look like this and uh, exact same, that's not a traditional Litvisha thing. Okay, leaving that aside, look how they spell the name of the yeshiva, Gavoha. That's not how it is. It's, there's a, um, Hey, at the end, and it has a line under it. It's so that's what we call a patach de nuva, or it's because tnuat patach de nuva, furtive patach. It's uh, it's not pronounced gavoa, gavoha, it's pronounced gavoa. The it should be uh, g o v o a h, uh, but there is one school getting back um, to Bergen County, they get it right. Yeshiva um. Because uh, before uh, certain letters, I and Chet, uh, for instance, um, hey, um, you don't say ha, you say he, if it's, uh, this, the accent's not on the uh, first syllable. I think, though, in modern Hebrew, they, they, this has changed also. I, someone who's from Israel could tell me. I think, don't you say today in Israel, ha ha ham, not he ha ha and ha, the holiday. If you look in uh, Tanakh, it's he I, I think everyone says ha ha uh, so. They get it right. Uh, but return back to what um, we were doing now. Let me show you the, um, the Mayan Omer, what he has to say, um, and why I say it agrees with um, uh, Rav Yosef. Here's the, look at the question. Ashkenazi that wants to do like Sfardim in the Minhagim, in the practices, for example, be Kitnios, who wants to continue to daven Nusach Hashkenaz, is this uh, permissible? And Rav Vadya answers, he can uh, just eat kidney oat. What I think that means is that is he can eat kidney oat and all the other Sephardic practices and still daven Nusach Hashkenaz, because it doesn't make sense. The question was, you know, all practices, uh, uh, Sephardi, except for not changing his davening, because we're used to davening, it's hard. It's very easy to become a Sephardi and other things, but how are we going to change our davening that we grew up with? But Rav Avad Yosef says it's better that you should um, do everything, including davening at the Shulchan Aruch. So here we have uh, Rav Yehuda Naki recording that Chacham Avad Yosef said that an Ashkenazi is allowed to become a Sephardi. And on page, this is page 8, if you look at page 10, which I don't have here, but I'm looking at it right now, um, he cites, he cites an example where uh, he once asked for Vad Yosef about people who want to become Sephardim. Can they do that? And Chacham Avadya says, no, 
they have to remain Ashkenazi, which is in line with Rav Yitzhak Yosef. However, uh, he says that, but he also asks them about a, um, a certain, you know, he also knows about a certain rabbi, um, a certain, I guess, important uh, Talmud Chacham, who decided he wanted to do everything like the Shulchan Aruch. I think he might be referring to Rav Cook of Tiveria. And he says that Chacham Avad Yosef gave a Hataras Nudarim and allowed it him to. And he says he knows of other cases where Ash- Rav Avad Yosef allowed Ashkenazim with a Hataras Nudarim to become Sfardim. So Rav Yehuda Naki thinks, this is what he says, he says that as a general rule, we don't tell people who come that you can become Sfardi, but if they want to, maybe I'm reading too much in it. He goes, we don't go out and tell people, we don't spread the word that they can become Sfardi, but if they want to, they can. Now, so why in that case, when uh, he asked the from Ashkenazi who want to be like Sfaradim, because maybe that was just a general question he's asking, can they? And therefore you say, no. But if people actually come and say, you know, I really want to be a Sfaradim, then you can. That's perhaps how you explain it. But, and we have, though, an uh, explicit answer here where uh, in, in various cases where Chacham Avad Yosef did say that an Ashkenazi come a Sfaradim. So that gives uh, support to Rav Avraham Yosef's position that uh, in Eretz Yisrael, since it's the land of the Shulchan Aruch, an Ashkenazi can become a Sfardi. When we pick up, we, I'll stop now, I'll take the questions. Next class, just to, we'll start with Rafael Shechter Schechter on the issue that I was asked. What about communities like Ethiopians who were not around during the days of the Gemara? Are they bound by it? And if so, why? And then we're going to get into the most, the fa- most famous tshuva in the book. There'll be, how, and, and Fascinating question also. Uh, how do you relate? How are we supposed to relate to someone like the Sakharani? Someone who uh, defames, um, you know, the Gedolim in our community. I'm not talking about Hashkafically, that like, he's not an anti-Zionist, things like that, but someone who degrades rabbis that we respect. Are we supposed to ignore it? Are we supposed to say rabbis will be rabbis? You know, they'll say crazy things sometimes. Or are we supposed to follow the halacha? That if someone who, explicit halacha, someone who degrades a Torah sage is, uh, is considered mechutz l'machana, out of the fold, which obviously we can't do because then we'd be putting a lot of rabbis out of the fold, but why not? I'll tell you about my conversation with Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik about this very point. Uh, what to do about great rabbis who defame other rabbis um, and uh, when we have an explicit rumble. We'll see what uh, Rav Yudor Tzolenkin says. We'll see what Rav Aviner says about this, and the Tshuva of Rehud Hankin has been repeated again and again, um, but only now do you know who the, the, the questioner was, and I'll explain to you why I, I asked this question. I developed a whole relationship at this time with the Satmar. Uh, I'm the reason why many books were printed by the Satmar, and they even came up to Cambridge, to Massachusetts, because I was giving them books. I'll tell you the whole story uh, uh, next class. Maybe I'll, if I remember, I'll show you a picture of me with some of them, if they don't mind. Uh, uh, so let me now take the questions. Thank you all. Um, I, I forgot to say the date. Um, it was uh, for posterity, uh, July uh, 14th, uh, 2020. He says that the Panim Eros is sponsored by a family related to him in Brooklyn, that is the, the, the kever, the, the grave. Should he say I ate on apple juice? Um, the, the question he deals with is, um, you know, sometimes the, uh, the, the drink, like vegetable soup, it becomes, it's overtaken, I guess you could say is a good word, by the, uh, the vegetable. So is apple juice overtaken by the apple, or is apple juice just uh, flavored water? Um, I used to know all these things because in Yeshiva we had a brachos bee. In Zev Elif's new book, he has a whole chapter on the brachos bee and how that was sort of like a, a, a from... Uh, takeover of the spelling bee and, uh, you know, for the Jewish schools. Uh, I think, uh, uh, what do we say on orange juice? I say shahakul, but uh, I think people, there are people, I believe, uh, someone could type it in, doesn't, aren't there people who say that you should say um, haetz on orange juice? In general, we, we have questions. Chocolate, what broth they make on chocolate? Everyone knows in the broth be it's shahakul, yet Rosh Hashanah Arbach held that you make haetz on it. But anybody else said, I know no one's going to listen to me. Your Pesach Frank also said, I ate. Try to figure out why uh, 
you, you don't make a eights on, um, it's not so simple. When we were in school, they told us that the potato chips, kadama, but Pringles, shahakul. Um, David Eisen says, we make a shakul on all beverages except wine based on toast. So the bracha on beer is also shakul and not mazonot since the majority is water and accordingly no bishalakum mishus. That is the minhag, but um, the panim eros did not accept that. And uh, he held that uh, you make on tea. He also said on tea, you make hadama. And uh, if you look in the arguments, uh, he, makes, uh, he makes sense. He's, not, <laughs> he's a very learned person. I don't think today there's anyone who holds what he says. Uh, Do I want a quota affirmative action for Sephardic Svarim and Ashkenazic yeshivas? What about a strimal? No, no affirmative action. You have to raise, you have to bring yourself up. Uh, and I'll be the first to admit it, although maybe this is going to get me canceled. Uh, you can't compare the Svarim, the Ashkenazic Svarim in recent years to the Sephardic Svarim in terms of Lundus. It's no comparison. Uh, someone who listens even sent me an article that appeared in Makar Rishon where he has Sephardic Russian yeshiva saying that themselves. And yeshivas today are understood, not halacha lamaisa, anything like that. They're understood in terms of lamdas. So if you want lamdas, you don't have anything in recent years in the Sephardic world uh, uh, that to equal Reb Chaim or any of the other uh, Litva Shogam Donim. You do have earlier on. So no, no, uh, no affirmative action uh, there. Uh, I think it's only, uh, knowing who sent the question, I know it's only tongue in cheek. Uh, um, Barry says the dispute arose in Chicago when um, Rav Aaron wanted to rescind smicha from Musmach to Kishol without a machitza. That was even more problematic, I have to say. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Rav Aaron Salvechik, and you'll hear next week one of the long discussions I had with him. But these Musmachim, for instance, uh, unless he had a, a, a grandfather clause, they were going on a long tradition in Skokie, and a heter given by Rabbi Regensburg, who was... Uh, one of the leading Rabboni in Chicago in the posseik at the uh, Skokie Yeshiva, a posseik there, that gave permission for them to take the traditional shuls. Uh, and even afterwards, uh, it's his, um, his brother, the Ralph, sent people to take uh, shuls without a machitza. Rav Aaron was, he did have a big battle with the conservatives and anything that approached that. He didn't want to allow them to use the mikvah for their conversions. The, the Tells Yeshiva went ahead and... Uh, when the, uh, the, the mikvah situation, which was built with certain monies, I think, from the Federation, uh, they didn't like Revaron's socks, so they went to uh, Ramosha Feinstein, uh, who said it was okay. Um, what was this? No, something's popping up on my screen. Oops. Um, hold on. Okay. Um, George. You once heard or Mordechai Tenler saying that wearing caps and gowns at graduation of a violation of Kukus Hagayim. When someone at the table challenged him with, but your father wears a cap and gown at the Wayu graduation, he replied, my father never asked me. Okay. <laughs> but the, the better question is why it should be a violation. Why it, it's not, uh, it has nothing to do with immorality, sexual immorality. It has nothing to do with um, Avodazara. So according to Pesach of the Shulchan Aruch, there's not a problem. You can see the long response of the Sri D H on the Bat Mitzvah issue. And he says, even a Bat Mitzvah, which definitely comes from out of the Christian confirmation sort of things through the reformers who did this. At the end of the day, the point of the Bat Mitzvah is not to imitate them. It's, to, it's a good idea. Recognizing the girls uh, coming attainment of mitzvot. He quotes in there a response of Rav Jolti. Rav Jolti was asked about um, a, a, a volley of... Um, you know, shooting off guns at a uh, military funeral. And uh, Rev. Weinberg says, also, oh, not a problem at all. Uh, he says that Chaim Rapport wrote a book defending Lubavitch messiness, who maintained that their long dead Rebbe is still the Messiah. He taught at the Open Orthodox Seminary for many years and was very beloved there. Um, I don't think he, did, he, what he wrote in his book was that uh, Lubavitchers who believe the Rebbe's Mashiach that doesn't mean they're heretics and uh, we can't trust their shlita or anything like that. Uh, you can uh, be off the derech and have crazy ideas. Satmar also has crazy ideas, but it doesn't mean that you're, um, you're out of the fold. Let's remember David Berger's book is called, uh, the subtitle of it, The Scandal of Orthodox Indifference. And that's the point. 
who were the people who were indifferent? The Gadolim, the, the great Poskim. They were asked this question, and with few exceptions, they all said, there's stupidity, and then there's heresy. And so these people are crazy, they're stupid, they're not, uh, they're not heretics. So that's, that's what he's talking about. Um, Rabbi Kelman has a link there to Rabbi Rappaport at the event with uh, dealing with homosexuality. I think in you, at least one of them is online on YouTube. I know that. Uh, yeah, it's it's online. O over 10,000 views, I think, actually. Uh, it's, that was a very uh, pretty amazing like panel. That's why I, know I, I put that there. It was from a few years ago, but I, if you're interested in the topic, Rabbi Greenberg, Rabbi uh, Rappaport, you know, sort of opposite extremes on the issue, if we could say that. Now, Zahav asks, the community is off in the state, so how, should the sta how much should the state pay to heal someone? I, I wouldn't accept that formulation, Zahav, because the, the community has no money. Uh, the community's money all comes from the people. So uh, the sa it's the same question. If, if the state is supposed to pay, let's say, to keep someone alive on a respirator uh, who's brain dead, or people who want to be kept alive, even though they're brain dead, for indefinitely, if it's gonna cost uh, a million a year, the state has no money. The money comes from the individuals. It comes from all of us who are taxpayers. So it's really the same, the same question, I think, uh, because the state's gonna have to tax us to get the money. And um, obviously you have to come up with um, policies for a state because uh, there are, we can't have people starving to death. On the other hand, uh, there has to be limits because we can't start closing down schools so that uh, everyone is, uh, is supported. Uh, I don't know the answer. This is, uh, this is tough. Uh, yes, Rabbi Kelman says you need to spend all your money to save your own life. That, that is correct. You couldn't say, if I have all this uh, money, I want to leave it for my children. Now, you, you do have to, according to Allah, you'd have to spend all your money to save your own life. As far as I can see, I was looking at the, the, the sources today. Uh, no one doubts that at all. Someone privately says, uh, I don't know what this is about. Uh, Okay, so someone that privately says there was a, what really brought down of Avram Yosef was that he um, fired someone who worked on the election campaign of Yadu Satora. Uh, and that's civil servant getting involved in things he shouldn't. Although the article I just pulled up from Surugim and a couple other places didn't mention that. Uh, but the person who sent that to me is in Israel. Uh, someone emails me that people change their nusach when they become Chabad. Uh, yeah, they do. They, uh, they could be uh, a Moroccan uh, Chabad sort of uh, insists on it, as far as I know, to, to change uh, your nusach. Not only do they change a the nusach, when Chabad opens a shul, uh, it takes over a shul. It could be an Ashkenazic shul, they change it. And, uh, they, but the Has it's not just Chabad, the Hasidim all held that you're supposed to change. Uh, to be a Hasid, you have to have nusach svart. And Chabad is basically nusach svart. They have their own uh, things in it. Because uh, the idea is that the Nusach the Sfard encompasses everything, Ashkenaz, and more. And so all Hasidim hold that when you become a Hasid, uh, you become, you should, not only should you do Nusach Sfard, the Nusach Sfard is the superior Nusach. Where Moshe finds he has a tshuva, he doesn't understand how people change their Nusach. Well, they, they changed it because the Rebbe's told them to change it. Uh, where Moshe thinks it's halakhically improper, but uh, they thought otherwise. Can you get Glock kosher in Montreal? Definitely in Montreal. You have a whole uh, Sephardic community. I assume in Toronto also, it's a very big city. But uh, when I say, um, you know, you go to most other places, I don't, in my town, West Orange, there's no, uh, uh, there's no God kosher uh, at all. Uh, I don't even know if in Teaneck there is. I saw one of the Sephardic rabbis in the supermarket and I asked him, do you buy this meat? He said, yes. He says, Rabben Chaim, he's the Sephardic Rosh Hashiv at YU, said for all the rabbis, wherever they are in America, they can buy regular Ashkenazic meat. And despite what Rav Yosef says, that was the practice. In Morocco, you didn't have God kosher. You didn't have God kosher in Italy. You didn't have God kosher in Tunisia, except for Jerba. It was very expensive. The non-Jews usually would not buy. Think of all the, if you shecht and you're only doing God kosher, you might get one out of every 10 that's glut. So you have to sell the others. But the non-Jews in many of these places refused to buy it because they didn't want to support the Jews. So they thought that if you reject this, we're not going to buy it from you. If it's bad, if it's not good enough for you, we're not going to buy it. So it became impossible. Even in Spain, which is where the whole glut kosher thing begins, the rabbis before the Spanish expulsion ruled, 
that uh, we don't keep God because economically it'll destroy us. And when they came to Morocco, that became a huge dispute between the, the Spanish rabbis who were called the Mogorashim, the ones who came from Spain who didn't keep Glot, and the ones who were in Morocco who kept Glot. And um, in places like uh, the north of uh, uh, Morocco, like Meknes, for instance, uh, all the big cities, uh, the Magorashim uh, were in Fez, the Magorashim were in charge. But in Marrakesh, then the, uh, the locals, the Toshavim they're called, they were in charge. Uh, yes, Susanna, Gavola, exactly. Uh, uh, the, the person who privately emailed something to me, send it to me privately because about the, the video of what we just spoke about because I, um, the, the audio, because once I close this up, I don't have everything. David Eisen from Israel says it's Hechacham. So I ask you, even in Israel today, but I ask you, is it Hechag or Hachag? Um, very nice. Um, oh, Mel says, you're right. No, it's July 13th, not July 14th. Thank you. Okay, so Hyman says, Mimayane uh, Hashua. That is a, um, that's based on a pasuk. That's an exception. Mimayane Hashua, exactly. It's the only example um, where you have it in Tanakh uh, differently. Um, now you say, um, in, in, in Torah, though, it's Mayano, yeah. Uh, you say that um, orange juice without pulp is, um, Mitzvah Alma, but with pulp, it's, um, you're saying um, it's Hadama. That's what I seem to recall also. More high tenor believes that caps and gowns come from priests. Well, <laughs> they come from the old universities, and all the old universities were institutes of theological instruction. Even American universities were institutes of theological instruction. So yes, it comes from the priests, but it has nothing to do with the priests anymore. So according to the, and it, has not, and, it has, and it has nothing to do with religion. It's simply the garb of the, it, it was the garb of the priests, but even in, when it was the garb of the priests, per se, it had nothing, and, and we took, it had nothing to do with religion. It's just a, a form of uh, like the, the, um, the collar. It's, it, it's not related to the religion. There's nothing I've heard of about the garb. The garb is just a sign that this is a minister, the minister of the cloth. Okay, but by the way, Rabbi Tenler is not alone. Uh, his position is held by uh, a number of people. His Hyman says, without hope, is shah. Okay, um, getting to the end of the questions. Um, finally, B says, Dr. David Berger makes good arguments. Rappaport accuses him of reckless discrimination. Berger is a great scholar. Just because Rappaport is a lavature, doesn't like what he wrote, doesn't make him reckless. He's a partisan Obavacher. He attacks Samuel Hyman for what about wrote about the late Rebbe. I, I'm I'm friends with Samuel Hyman, but Heilman. But I have to tell you, take a look. Rappaport did make good points. You have to read the back and forth. Um, and uh, Heilman and Friedman, I knew Friedman as well. I had to acknowledge that Rappaport has some very good points. I, I'm not going to get into this. Wait into this dispute. If Rabbi Kelman is crazy, he can have a debate about not Chabad between Berger and Rappaport. I'm not going to get involved with it. I'm just saying that um, these questions have been asked to the big halachic authorities. They ask, can you eat the OK Ashkacha? Can you eat OU? OU in Italy, these are messianic types in Milan who give the Hashkacha, who are the Mashkichim in, uh, in Italy. And the answer that's come back from the post scheme, the leading post scheme, is not like what Dr. Berger says. I'll, I'll tell you, now it could be that they're wrong and Dr. Berger's right. I'll end with this story that he told me. Uh, and. Uh, um, and then we'll leave with this. Uh, and Dr. Berger gave me an example to show that sometimes the rabbis uh, don't get it. And he could be right. Uh, when he came to speak in Scranton, I had to make sure what uh, food I got him because uh, to avoid the Chabad thing. Uh, he told me a case where someone, uh, the case was as follows, that he was asked by a rabbi. He, uh, it was an intermarriage. And the mother was Jewish, so the child was Jewish, and the child was born a boy. And the mother, of course, wanted the child to have a bris. The father refused to give the child a bris. He says, if you want to have a circumcision, I'll only do it if uh, we can also baptize the kid. I understand. It. That's his, uh, if they're going to not, either they don't do any religion, if they do religion, they're baptized. So, um, 
this person who Dr. Berger was talking to me about, uh, who was asked this question by this rabbi, uh, this rabbi, um, oh yeah, no, no, so Berger, this is how the story was. He told me he was, he spoke, one of the big rabbis, I think it was in Kew Gardens, he told this story to the question he was asked. And the rabbi said as follows, what's the problem? Just let the galach sprinkle some water on him. What do we care? You can see from the standpoint of the rabbi, what's the big deal? You want to circumcise the kid. The priest comes in, throws a little water, gazunt, and then you, uh, you circumcise him. Berger said to me, he didn't say it to the rabbi, I guess, people allowed themselves to be killed in medieval times rather than having that water sprinkled on them. It just shows how far we're away from medieval times and, uh, you know, the issues of pikuach uh, nefesh and yahard vel yavor, etc., that a rabbi flippantly would say, just throw the water on the kid, we don't care. Again, this is something that Jews not only allowed themselves to, be, uh, to die, they killed their children to prevent them from having this uh, water thrown on them. Or maybe that's putting it too far. Maybe, the, maybe that's not why they killed them, because they killed them to prevent them from being raised Christian. But we do know that they allowed themselves to be killed, both them and their children, so as not to have the water thrown on them. When we go to Portugal, which we should have been shortly, I will talk about the great massacre where the Jews allowed, committed suicide rather than be baptized. And here a rabbi can flippantly say, and I understand why he says it flippantly. If you ask everyone on the street, they'll say, what's the big deal? What do we care what this uh, guy does? He throws some water on, but uh, you need to circumcise a kid. So rabbi, I know that Dr. Berger, who's also a Muslim, his position, I even debated him this once publicly on this matter, he holds that the rabbis don't get it. Dr. Berger, a great scholar of uh, Jewish Christian relations in medieval times, he sees the Chabad Messianism not as shtus, as a foolishness. He sees this as uh, Christianity revived, uh, the you know, second coming, all this stuff. And he thinks that's only because the rabbis are ignorant of the history and of what uh, Christianity means. That's why they look the other way. Maybe it could be, but uh, last I looked, uh, when it comes to halacha and whether something's kosher or not, we go to the rabbis. We don't go to the historians. And Dr. Berger himself, as I said last week, told me that even if I'm convinced that Ramosha Israelis is wrong, that shituf is not permitted for non-Jews, as a matter of practice, I still can rely on him because he's the Ramah. And who, who am I? Uh, so very good. Uh, yes, he did not get food from a, I know he doesn't hold from a Babish Mashkiach. He is a great scholar. I'll, I'll, I've had him speak in my university, I think three times. I'll be, I'm the biggest fan as, of him as uh, imaginable. I think everything he does is great, and uh, except for maybe that. And he's also, he's all Hashem Shemayim. He's lost uh, a lot of money. There are many shuls that won't have him speak as a scholar in residence, even if he speaks on other things because of uh, that book of his. Um, so I'm not saying this in any way to smirch him. Uh, I'm just saying the reality is that, uh, as the subtitle of his book says, that there is indifference. And uh, it's not just, and, and, they, and the great rabbis, I know of some by name, have said explicitly, including Rabbi Huda Lankin, who we spoke about, that uh, these people are, make a mistake. But that doesn't mean they're outside the fold. It doesn't mean that you can't uh, trust their kashras or anything like that. Uh, Obviously, we can't have them come to teach our children and things like that, this idea. But uh, I say this as someone who went to Camp Gan Yisrael <laughs> when I was a kid. Uh, but then it was kept secret, maybe. Uh, um, and I'm a, as someone who travels around and knows many, many Chabad and, uh, and um, is involved with them in many ways, and I know that uh, many of them have nothing to do with this. And uh, the idea that all of them hold this view, it's not true. And, uh, okay, that's all I say about it. Uh, I thank you uh, very much for coming tonight, and uh, we'll see you uh, uh, next week, God willing.